Vasudevaya. So um, I'll be responding to a, another question <clears throat> that was sent in. And the question, <clears throat> excuse me, is what is self-love? Um, well, it, it concerns that. That was not the actual question, but that's the way things are going to, um, that's the focus. Before I read the question, I'm not going to read the question until a little bit later, and uh, you'll probably understand why when I do read it. When we speak of self-love, I think there is a need to understand the, the meaning of the words. If we look at the dictionary definition of love as a noun. <clears throat> All di dictionaries pretty much state this, a profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person. And then another meaning is a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection as for a parent, a child, or a friend. So we, we see that actually since language has been around, love has always meant an expression of affection for one person for another. It, it has never meant anything else. We have entered a really interesting time that began actually in the academe in America in the 60s with all a lot of new ideas were introduced in connection with, with psychology um, and sociology. And people sought to promote new ideas, more modern ideas and types of, of appreciation. And what we observe is that there is a very strong tendency that, that has developed in society. Well, it's, it's always been there, but it's become increasingly pronounced in this last century, which there was a brilliant BBC documentary titled The Century of the Self. And um, it, it examined this idea, the, the way in which the focus towards self over and above everything else became increasingly pronounced for, for thousands of years. Of course, there's always been a sense of self and an understanding of self, but there was a bigger picture um, to do with community, with society, and where I fit. And there was always a balance between the idea of duty towards others and, and relationships and responsibilities connected with that and, and with, uh, you know, the idea of self-importance. But we saw over the um, last century, throughout the 1900s, with the introduction of, of all of the manipulation that's been that was used in advertising. This was a, a new phenomena. The more people came to understand human psychology, the more it was used to manipulate society, individuals within society. And of course, that's carried on in, in the most extreme form now with the way in which social media is operated. So with that growing um, sense of, of self and self-importance, there was a, um, 
this sort of like understanding that people developed that if I like an idea and I take it on board, then I embrace it as being both good and true. And then that leads to this other notion that if someone doesn't like that idea, that I perceive it as a personal attack. So we have tended to lose objectivity because of an over-focus upon self and self-worth. Before we visit that any further, who, who is the self? Who, who am I? You'll see that, you know, in all genuine spiritual teaching, there is this really um, foundational principle that the body which I have on and the mind which I am using is not me. This is something, a body that I am occupying and, a, and the mind is meant to be something that I am using and meant to be putting to good use. In the materialistic philosophy, the idea is that the body is the self. And so we see this, you know, it's so pervasive now. I mean, even with this word selfie that we've spoken of so many times, the idea that I'm taking a picture of myself. And there is this now people are, have, you know, it's, it's a, if the concept even exists, it's buried so deeply the idea that the body is not me. And this has led to um, this adoption of the idea of the body as being the self is the foundation for all of society's problems. And I would be prepared to discuss or debate that principle um, with fundamentally anyone because it, it, it is the truth and it is a reality. When people begin to tie the idea of my worthiness, my being acceptable, my being lovable, desirable, all of these things, only to the condition, the physical appearance and condition of this body, this is a formula for enormous unhappiness. It can never go anywhere else. Even when one attains some peak of beauty and physical fitness, it can't last. It will always deteriorate. Old age is, is an inevitable reality. And so there is much suffering that is coming up in society because of this false concept of the self, the false identification with the body as, as being the self. Now we go to the topic of self-love. Just from the historically accepted definition of love and how it was understood for thousands and thousands of years, it involved relationships. But now in the 60s, in the academe in America, that was introduced this idea that it is possible to love oneself, that you can actually have a deeply affectionate relationship with yourself. Prior to the 60s, this was considered actually a psychological problem. There were names like narcissism, in all its shapes and forms, etc. But now we had this, this radical overturning of this idea that it is possible to come to um, love and to deeply love yourself. What was the root and, and the cause of this? Well, it's hard to pinpoint um, exactly but it has largely grown out of the fact 
that people came to seek a solution to the pain that they suffered from failed relationships, from not being able to depend on others and trust others and give their heart to others, etc. And and I think if we look at the, you know, the song that Whitney Houston sang, the greatest love of all. I mean, it it spells it out clearly. Interestingly, although she, you know, took this to the number one on the charts in 1986. It was actually a song that was written quite a bit earlier, about nine years earlier, and sung um, nine years earlier in 1977. And of course, the title being The Greatest Love of All. One would have to really pause for a moment and think of that. There is no greater love than what has been espoused here. And I'm going to read the lyrics, and I... (laughs) I hope you can bear with me and just listen. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride. Make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. In the next verse, everyone's, everybody's searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. I never found anyone who fulfilled my needs. A lonely place to be. And so I learned to depend on me. So right away you can you're developing the sense of where this thing is going, that this quest for self-love was being driven by a lack of fulfillment in relationships and being able to look up to someone, finding someone that's dependable, etc. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's anybody's shadow. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I live as I believe. Well, interesting that then she's not saying, or the lyrics are not saying, that this is a sure path to success. You may succeed, you may fail, but at least you're doing what you believe. No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity. Because the greatest love of all is happening to me, I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. I think that that is profoundly sad and and, and really disturbing. We have a natural tendency to love. It is part of our eternal spiritual being. In the ancient Vedic texts, the great yogis understood a truth. And there is a a verse in what's called the Brahma Samhita that states that we are bound eternally to the supreme soul by a bond of kinship affectionate kinship. That is our nature. And that is why we are driven and motivated to try to seek love, because it is actually a spiritual need. There is a reality that while we may have wonderful relationships, and while we can have great affection for other people of this world, It is not sufficient to completely satisfy this deep spiritual need that we have. The process of yoga and meditation is the process by which this love becomes actually uncovered. And by uniting in love with the um, Supreme Soul, 
one can experience and fulfill this long-held desire for the most perfect love. When we speak of self-love and people's idea of self as that which is material, that which is temporary, if I cannot find perfection in my relationships with other material personalities, then how am I going to find perfection and taste actual love with my own body and mind? That is a material covering of the eternal spiritual being. And by attempting to focus and feel affection for that material object, which is not me, which I will leave behind at death and move on, how can that fulfill me? It, it can't. It can't. One will potentially develop a false sense of worthiness and fulfillment, but it can't last. It won't last. It's, it's not possible when you look at it very objectively. So one of the things that people have difficulty if I start going in this direction as I, I become potentially accused of being insensitive and uh, quite the opposite. I, I, I'm, a, I'm totally into love. I'm totally into relationship. But I know that they have to be fundamentally spiritual in nature to be utterly fulfilling and completely ecstatic. I know that to be a reality. What's happened, though, over time is, is people have diluted the word love. A lot of people have suffered, you know, in the early part of their life, rejection in different ways or, you know, being, being bullied or being spoken down to and they haven't developed a sense of self and I'm saying that from a spiritual perspective, a sense then, of course, of self-worth and everything. Everything is tied to other people's opinions and what they've said to me. And so if I treat myself, meaning my body and my false conception of who I am, you know, with, with tenderness, then perhaps that can counter. And yeah, that can be a little bit, Maybe for a little while it can be helpful, but it doesn't actually completely do the trick. The more we become self-focused, initially we might convince ourselves that this is a really good thing to do and I'm getting a rush out of it. It cannot produce long-term happiness it will lead to unhappiness because it is running counter to our deep and eternal spiritual nature. That is why it's not good. And that is why it's not right for people to have a false expectation that they can find complete happiness in an attempt to love themselves. You need to be in relationship. That is part of the nature of the soul itself, the spiritual being, to be in relationship, but to be in spiritual relationship. I understand that people want to try and correct the harm and damage that comes from, from putting someone down, from falsely, or from, from battering somebody mentally and, you know, giving them all this very negative feedback. But don't choose a false solution. It cannot provide a permanent answer. It's not going to be a permanent solution. The solution has to be spiritual in nature. 
if we understand what is the self and what is love, you will quickly come to appreciate that you cannot be the highest object of love and joy to yourself. It's, it's not a spiritual possibility. Does that mean that people then can degrade others and speak ill of others and hurt others with their speech? Of course not. That's not being promoted. You know, that should not happen. The more a person becomes immersed in a spiritual understanding of who they are and their identity, then the more a person will have compassion for others. They'll see the spiritual identity of others, living beings having a temporary material experience in a certain type of body. We will see beyond those superficialities. So, but the idea of self-love has become so widely used and promoted without any form of critical analysis, without any form of even non-critical analysis. There is no analysis. There is just a wide embrace of some nebulous concept that's held to be, to be good. And, and part of the big problem was that advertising agencies realize that this is an amazing idea to latch on to, to sell merchandise. And so when it comes to Mother's Day, when it comes to Valentine's Day even, people are told to splurge on themselves, to show love for themselves. And, <laughs> and the world in the last like five or six years, eight years, you know, there's just been this radical focus on treating yourself to something nice, being good to yourself, pampering yourself, loving yourself. And, and so this messaging has just been so deeply reinforced in society, but it's not, it's not healthy and it's not good and it doesn't bring, to, bring about real solutions. So now I'm going to read the question having spoken about that and and you'll you'll understand perhaps why i put it off until the end i have a question what is self love i hear a lot and a lot of people say i have to love myself first before i can love someone else or help someone else that's not true that's not true at all unfortunately it is confusing because isn't that what people are already doing, but they don't really notice it, and as a result, they're unhappy. <laughs> so I'll read that again because I'm I, I I laughed when I when I read this. I thought it was so wonderful that here a person in in their straightforwardness and and innocence are just speaking their mind and what they are speaking is that which is actually true. It is confusing because isn't it that people are already doing uh, are already doing that but they don't really notice it and as a result they're unhappy. So she's making the statement and as she's observed in life that when people become self-focused, they fundamentally will end up becoming unhappy. And this is what most people are doing anyway. We've had so many talks about the joys of giving, the joys of sharing, the joys of, of offering something to those who have less than ourself. And how that taps into a deep spiritual experience, actually, without realizing it. So they're already doing this, and as a result, they're unhappy. And so then the self-love is a way to try and treat the pain of unhappiness. And of course, the unhappiness coming from being self-focused. But what is it? 
what it is, is really a repeat of what they're already doing? And the answer is yes, it is a repeat of what they're already doing. And they also take the message of meditation in this way, that it is self-love, and they see it as a practice of self-love. Is it really? And the answer is no. Of course, it's doing great good for oneself. It's taking care of oneself. It's going to make your life better and your life, the experience of life better. But one should not perceive it wrongly as being a for, form of, of self-love because it, it's really not. It is a great desire, firstly, to come to realize, to d discover who I actually am in the core of my being, who I really am, and then to reconnect with the greatest source of joy, the greatest object of love. This is the actual purpose and focus of meditation. So thank you very much for sticking with me through that one. Um, might be a bit much for some people. It's kind of really unfortunate that we've we've been encouraged to, it's like the world has become increasingly dumbed down. We just are taught to respond to emotions and feelings. We don't really actually get into thinking about stuff and analyzing things, even our own experience in life. And that's not healthy and that's not good. So we will um, chant these spiritual sounds and meditation and feeling gratitude and a submissiveness of heart, a humility. If one engages in this meditation upon these transcendental sounds, these sacred names, then one will grow in their realization, in their understanding and the awakening of this amazing condition of spiritual love that we all seek and desire. Thank you very much. I'm going to sing Om Hari Om. Om Hari
Thank you very, very much 